Welcome, this session is part of the support offer from NCFE's Provider Development Team. Our purpose is to support the teaching, learning and assessment of the technical qualifications. For this session, we're joined by the Sector Manager, Janet King, who will help us to contextualise the content. Hello, Janet, and thanks for joining us. Hello, Helen. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. So the purpose of today's session is to support you in your T-level journey so that you can provide the best outcomes for your learners. The objectives of the session are shared for you and we'll review these at the end. Hopefully you'll feel supported and more confident in your onboarding journey with an increased understanding of the support offered from NCFE at each stage of your T-level delivery. On the screen now is a high level overview of today's session. We're going to explore the core content, the theory of learning and the importance of retrieval practice. Please apply the content of the session to your context and your current T-level students and evaluate how you could apply the content to your teaching, learning and assessment practice. So let's start with the core knowledge. So the core knowledge is divided into 12 elements and four core skills, all of which indicate the relevant knowledge and understanding of concepts, theories and principles relevant to all occupations within education and childcare. The knowledge and skills are externally assessed through written examinations and an employer set project. This section contains all of the mandatory teaching content that underpins the knowledge and skills. The content provided in some cases may not be exhaustive and providers may wish to teach beyond what is included in the specification in order to support the student's knowledge and understanding. The content does not have to be taught in a linear fashion. However, providers must pay attention to when the assessments are due to take place to ensure that all of the mandatory content, and that's all the elements and performance outcomes, have been taught to students prior to sitting the assessments. So let's have a look for a moment at an example delivery model. The term started in September. And all the core knowledge, the 12 elements, must be delivered by May to ensure that students are ready for their core assessments. Not only must the content be taught, but students must have, a, have effectively learned the content from the qualification specification to enable them to succeed in their assessments. The important thing to raise here is that the students must be able to apply the skills and knowledge gained in the teaching and learning activities to their practice. This is clear in the assessment objectives. I'm sure you have already or will be currently completing your initial assessment and assessing your students starting or current levels of knowledge and understanding. And then formative assessment and milestones tracking for learning will be of paramount importance to ensure your students are adequately prepared for assessments. Okay, we'd like, now like you to consider how you're going to deliver the qualification spec to your students. If we know that the core knowledge needs to be learned to support students in their core exams, then what does effective learning look like? Please take a moment to consider the question, what makes learning effective? What factors make learning work for your students? So the birth to part five mat matters. Recognises the characteristics of effective learning. This is important for your students to understand and recognise within their role, but it also will have been the starting point of your students' own journey towards effective learning. Within a key, key stage three and key stage four environment and beyond, it can perhaps be summarised as being active and strategic, being skilled in cooperation, dialogue and creating knowledge with others, being able to develop goals and plans and to monitor their own learning and that is versatile across contexts. Cognitive science has been used increasingly to inform interventions, practice and policy in education. Within interventions, a variety of strategies to recall information from memory, for example, flashcards, practice tests or quizzing or mind mapping are used in addition to focusing students on key information without overloading them, for example, by breaking down or chunking subject content or using worked examples or scaffolds. Managing cognitive load and spaced learning 
distributing learning and retrieval opportunities over a longer period of time instructional coaching and using verbal and non-verbal information all continue to be considered effective teaching practice. The early career framework states that teachers must learn that work and memory is where information that is being actively processed is held but its capacity is limited and can be overloaded. Similarly, the evidence review underpinning the Ofsted inspection framework draws significantly on approaches inspired by cognitive science. And the principles of cognitive science are typically derived from two areas of research. And that's cognitive psychology, which is underpinned by interpretive, behavioral and observational methods, and is perhaps recognized in con conversations around ways in which learning is influenced and the results observed in individuals or small groups. Uh, and cognitive neuroscience, which is the physiological response of the brain rather than the behavioral response. Janet, can I just bring you in here to ask for your feedback and information comments on cognitive science? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Helen. So I think a lot of this is all coming down to the fact that we are, as human beings, influenced by our biological genes, but also aware of that neuroplasticity, aware of what can go wrong, aware of the influence of our experiences. And it all really boils down to the fact that we are juggling this sort of um, biological um, impact of the brain and the structures and what's going on and, and all of that. But that is also being impacted and the quality of that function, if you like, is being impacted by our experiences, by what's what, by what's going on and, and the influences and impact around us. And that is such an interpretative view if you think about those experiences. And it's also unique. So it makes jobs um, that we have as, as um, when we're working with young people, the jobs that you have incredibly difficult because you're tuning in to, to and trying to tune into an unknown. And those unknowns can actually appear day by day. You might learn something new or something could happen where you see, you know, we, we, we see or we, we use the remark, oof, um, didn't expect that or that I've seen another side of that student today and that can be a good or sometimes a surprisingly um, shocking thing so I think it's about tuning in to our students being aware of that which I know um, tutors are and then trying to find a diverse way of teaching and learning that allows for those uh, for that for that sort of that cognitive that metacognition to take on board so that learners can remain active so that they can feel they can contribute to their own learning and participate in a way that's going to give them confidence to grow and, and to change so difficult to always know how to get things right but I know that tutors work incredibly hard to try and tune in to their learners as, as do early years practitioners and, and teaching assistants and teachers to try and tune in to the young children that they're working with also so um, yeah it's about acknowledging that what's going on and the impact of, of, uh, of triggers and of the brain in the influence that's coming from our experiences and our interpretive um, social world. Not easy, Helen. <laughs> Absolutely not. So we're now going to look at cognitive science within the education childcare qual spec. It's element two, uh, supporting education, and it makes explicit reference to metacognition. As part of the core knowledge, strand 2.4, T-level students must be taught to understand metacognition and how it supports the young people they will be working with to manage their own learning. Arguably, it's important that T-level students are aware of and able to manage their own learning using and applying metacognitive strategies. And indeed, all the knowledge points on the screen now apply equally to your students as, as they do to the children you are teaching them to effectively work with. So now we'll move on to and exemplify effective teaching and learn strategies. And we're going to contextualize them to the T-level elements, including examples we can apply in practice. And whilst the exemplifications are related to the content of the T-level to promote learning for your T-level students, these are effective teaching strategies to encourage your students to apply in their own placement practice, particularly those who are considering going through going into teaching or those who have chosen the assisting teacher and occupational specialism. So here are some strategies. You're probably already familiar with some 
or all of them. Let's see how they apply to the T level. And Janet, as we go through them, I'm going to ask you to apply some context to each of them. OK, yeah, lovely. As we explore each of the strategies, and we're going to, I'm going to start off by defining each of them, and we'll then provide an explanation of the strategy in the context of education and childcare in early years. Then we'll make a direct link to the T-level qualification spec for the core knowledge delivery, and we'll provide further example contextualised to the T-level that we can explore further or discuss, which you can then apply directly to your own practice and delivery to be effective in teaching and learning. So to consider an example contextualised to the T-level, we can explore further or discuss which you can then apply directly to your own practice. I'm going to refer back to the core knowledge highlighted earlier and the delivery model to ensure that all content is taught before the core assessments. So spaced learning. This takes careful planning to ensure that students revisit a specific content, idea, topic or, or, or several topics over time. So for example, over the course of a week or many weeks. However, the careful planning is worth it when looking at the delivery model in having pupils revisit key concepts and ideas over longer periods. And this increases the likelihood of, of knowledge being embedded into the long-term memory, which is the golden ticket for terminal assessment that the T-level uses. Thankfully, the holistic nature of child development provides natural crossover concepts across the elements. And as such, there is an opportunity for space practice in the delivery of the qualification spec. If this is the first time teaching, you may be following NCFE schemes of work, either by the elements or by the themes. Through delivery, as your confidence grows and you become more familiar with the content, your experience will support you to see where there is opportunity to maximise the impact of space learning, both within and across the elements. I'm going to ask Janet to bring in a quick example of what this might look like. Thanks, Helen. So I think while we're looking at these elements, we're, all, we're, we're almost looking at something in a modular fashion. And I think what the what the themes do is bring over the idea of holistic learning. And, and so when you're looking almost in, in that sort of spaced learning, small chunks, small um, aspects of elements, you're also able to take a breathing space really for, for consolidation, for embedding and reinforcement, as it says on the slide here. So take those opportunities opportunities for formative assessment even if you're delivering those elements in a sort of independent discrete manner then have a look maybe at the themes or have a look at where different elements may overlap and think about how you could bring that formative assessment on board to consolidate and embed chunks of learning together so looking at how your learners are um, consolidating their own knowledge and thinking about how you've delivered and when the best times are to actually take some time Time for reflection, to look at consolidation, to use that as part, part of formative assessment, then you, might, you may want to look at aspects within an element as part of that formative assessment and then build upon that so that eventually as you work towards um, exam preparation, for example, that you're able to use the same sort of approaches to bring together the elements that are going to be assessed, you know, sort of um, one to six in, in, in paper A, for example. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Janet. And there is much value in considering how spacing can be informed and enhanced by your classroom feedback and assessment. Teachers can use assessment to decide how often learning material should be revisited, and it's the best time to, when's the best time to increase the challenge or move on. We'll refer back to element two of the qual spec, supporting education. And many of those statements can arguably be used to support T-level students. Identifying the strengths in areas development and their own learning, using metacognitive strategies to regulate and evaluate their own learning and progress, better preparing them for assessments and monitoring their own understanding. And sharing these with students can encourage them to keep information in mind as they learn it rather than compartmentalizing it after each theme or element as the teaching allows for the learning lag and then carefully timed staggered learning checks in place or exploring previously taught content at a deeper level can support spaced practice 
So we'll move on to the next strategy, which is interleaving. And perhaps maths is the most relevant area of learning which, in which interleaving has been promoted, opposed to block study, where students study a topic in its entirety. Interleaving involves various skills or concepts being intermixed. So research suggests that while students may perform better on blocked tasks during learning, the opposite is true when they are tested at a later date, which is important when we consider the importance of learning and desire to transfer learning to long-term memory. Interleaving has been proven to be effective in transferring both knowledge and skills to the long-term memory. An example of this in the world of sport, interleave practice of particular skills has proven to be successful compared to drills, which focus on one skill performance at a time. For example, different golf swings improves overall confidence and performance in the long term compared to block practice. Here's an example of interleaving contextualized to child development and linked to the T-level core content 4.1, and that's element four all about behavior. Janet, what are your thoughts on interleaving, please? I think it makes absolute sense, Helen. And I think what we were talking about previously about sort of having time to reflect, making opportunities for consolidation, bringing things together um, really helps that sort of that real learning and for, for the student themselves to have mastery over a topic rather than a particular focus criterion for example so I think what it does um, is, is really help to gel that knowledge in, in preparation and make sense through holistic opportunities and one way of being able to do that is to bring the theory and practice into the classroom so wherever you can I, I'd say especially in education and, and early years where you can use scenarios where you can use actual placement experience or uh, you know things like that that will bring things alive and help the students to make sense of so in child development for example where you might be thinking of a, you might be looking at physical development and you've been concentrating on keywords and key terms and key milestones and, and so on within physical development you then start to look at the child at a certain age or stage and you're sort of bringing in you're interleaving all of the different components um, in a holistic way Way by looking at all the other areas and I think teachers and tutors do that quite incidentally but it's good to know that that's actually a really good valuable learning strategy. Absolutely totally agree Janet thank you. Uh, I mean another example of interleaving as, of, as a teaching strategy is applied on the slide to element two supporting education. Opposed to a block approach where they learn about each theorist in isolation an interleave approach is more effective in that it challenges students to compare, contrast and discriminate the learning. The focus here is on making the link between different areas as they switch between them. The benefits of this approach is, a, is a, an idea that when students have to extract learning from a series of pieces of information about a concept, in the examples shared we use the concept of theoretical approaches, Students are better able to extract the gist of all the information present, presumably through comparing examples and counterexamples. This approach supports students in the extended answer questions in the core assessments, for example, the question on the screen now. It's important to note here that the qualification spec states that students must understand the strengths and limitations of these theories. This is where your role as a teacher is paramount to support students in their capacity for metacognition and self-regulation by modelling your own thought process when engaging in the task and where to begin with the question, how to plan the structure of the written response, making particular choices of words and phrases and breaking down the assessment objectives and the detail of what the, the response needs to demonstrate is also very useful. So if you use big questions or key inquiry questions as part of your learning interventions, share it, for example, at the start of a lesson, then a useful idea is to revisit these later with a retrieval task. Learning intention should be long-term. The benchmark being to check if information has been learned and can be recalled from the long-term memory. So, Think about some big questions that you could ask your students, perhaps linked to areas of the T level we've already discussed today. Aim to focus on and include big questions. 
in your teaching and learning that link with new material being introduced and taught in your lessons. As it has just been GCXE exam results time, we'll immediately go to 9.2 and the student must understand the following current priorities and debates in education. For example, what was the impact of the national curriculum reforms? What were the aims of statutory testing? And what were or are the impact of exam stress on children and young people's health and well-being? So to highlight briefly where an example from the June 2022 core exam, you can see how big questions, uh, as, as Sharington describes it as elaborative interrogative questioning or learning intentions can support students in answering these questions. Through the interrogation, the questioning and the revisiting of learning theories, the big questions and all the smaller recalls of knowledge, for example, A or 1, students are more likely to have a stronger gasp, grasp of new learning and the more connections they will have created that will help them to remember it later. OK, we're now going to move on to elaboration. And the premise of elaboration is that understanding occurs when students elaborate a memory by adding detail to it and integrating it with existing knowledge. And it can be enhanced by several effective strategies. Within the area of child development, the idea of memory and how it changes, Tom Sherrington in his book, Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction and Action, talks about students engaging in elaborative, interrogative question. And how does this happen? Why does this happen? This type of question has a strong effect on the future retention of learning. And core knowledge point 7.1 is shown. But students must also understand the impact cognitive skills and cognitive difficulties have on memory, short and long term, and on language, communication and development, including the impact of building on prior knowledge, especially as part of element 11, uh, understanding SEND. Janet, what are your thoughts on this strategy, please? I think it's really, really important that we actually acknowledge the the, um, the term that you just finished on there, actually, Helen, and that prior knowledge, because it's all about what a child, what a young person can do, what, what's been, where are they now? So we have to really find out about that. We have to know what the child can do. And then we're kind of constructing something. So we're thinking, just reminds me um, a little bit of accommodation and simulation of knowledge and all new experiences will make sense and they will build on and they will give a greater awareness but for some individual children they will find it difficult to be to to retain that knowledge so how can we find ways to help um, children remember how can we think about ways that will give um, more immediate recall how familiar are our students with the terminology so are they able to accommodate this new learning? Are they able to assimilate it? What are they associating it to? So what sorts of experiences, what sorts of teaching and learning is going on in the classroom to help learners to be familiar, to really understand what a new term, new vocabulary, new element and so on, what it actually might mean. Learning about theory is a, is a really good example of that. Learning about what's happening um, with with individual children what might impact that what might influence that from a sort of um biological and again from from more of a social cultural experience and what can we do to help those children to understand to grasp to to find a level of metacognition where they're learning independently contributing participating remembering and making sense of um, a new aspect of learning that new aspect of learning may take some careful scaffolding to be able to uh, allow for elaboration to take place but it's that input it's that motivation it's that allowing for active learning and it's about um, repeating rather than duplicating in a way but sometimes students need more and more exposure to a learning outcome and a learning term to be able to fully appreciate what it means and for that to become assimilated so not to take something that's really really common understanding for, for to, to us but to actually break that down and to think about how we could scaffold that to make sense of it so that a student can elaborate on that in a familiar and sound knowledgeable way 
Agreed. And there are different elaboration approaches, that, the, but the commonality is that they all involve a level of cooperative learning which supports memory development. And in the book Make It Stick, the authors write, the more you can explain about the way your new learning relates to prior knowledge, the stronger your grasp of the new learning will be and the more connections you'll create that will help you to remember it later. Encouraging a teach it to learn it approach such that the active teaching also engages work in memory can support your students. Through activities that involve peer teaching or learning in pairs and small groups, students can enhance the learning by applying their working memories to the task of explaining and teaching new content to others. And if you use the big questions or key inquiry questions as part of your learning intentions shared at the start of the lesson, then a useful idea is to revisit these later with a retrieval task. Learning intention should be long term. The benchmark being to check if information has been learned and, you, and can be recalled from the long term memory. So think again, please. Can you generate some big questions, perhaps linked to the areas again of the tea level we've already discussed? Aim to focus and include big questions that link with new material being introduced and taught in lessons. As it has just been GC exam results again, we can go back to learning from the GCSE prior learning years. And then looking at 9.2 again, the students must understand current priorities and debates in education. How can they make links to previous education and not education um, priorities, sorry, and not just what they are, but why they are and how they are. Remembering that why and how that's extremely important in elaboration. So the next strategy relates to having concrete examples and these help to illustrate abstract ideas and make them easier to understand. Abstract ideas such as childhood amnesia can be vague and hard to grasp and therefore harder for the students to understand and remember. Within the T-level knowledge and understanding we highlight empathy here. Arguably it may still be an abstract concept for many of your students, yet it is part of the professional behaviours expected of them, as can be seen in the statement from element two. Furthermore, your students are required to understand the concept of empathy in element four around behaviour, such that in 4.1 the student must understand how the stages of social development may inform levels of empathy and as practitioners need to use that knowledge to meet the needs of children and young people. Throughout the core knowledge, there are a number of abstract concepts your students may struggle to learn unless they are provided with a concrete example. Janet, what type of concrete examples would be useful in the T-level, do you think? Thanks, Helen. I think when you've got exposure to placement and in, in the early years, and I think indeed in assisting teaching as well, students are likely to be going out to placement quite early on in the, in the qualification delivery. So I think it is really, really important to be able to bring, to bring back to the classroom some of those wonderful examples that students will have. So in the classroom, they're looking at the what, you know, em empathy being this example here. So what do we mean by that? This is going to be a new term, but if we explain it, if we talk about care and and compassion and so on students are going to have a little bit of understanding and they'll think of examples um, that they will then gain confidence from because those examples will be things from their own placement things from their own experiences and so on and so they are if you like constructing new knowledge and assimilating that around what 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 does empathy mean and I think they have to have that knowledge first of all and be confident in what they understand and what they could recognize as empathy in action and then of course they need to know why is it important why does it matter to me why is empathy important in the job that I do and that sincerity of, of care compassion and, and empathy for advocating for, for babies young children and families and then how how do I do it how does that fit into the context and this is where scenarios role play examples um looking at even if we were looking at sort of um video clips where you're seeing that empathy from a caregiver to a young child is going to allow for discussion again you're adding new layers of knowledge to 
what is the breadth of this empathy? What does it mean? Why is it important? How do I apply it? How have I seen it? And it's only then that you can really expect somebody who's new to a subject area to be able to demonstrate that. So it's a, it's a process that's scaffolded, that's broken down, but it starts with the what, and then must include lots of practical, concrete examples where student can, students can make sense and build from something they recognise as empathy in this particular context. Thanks, Helen. Exactly. Thank you, Janet. And continuing with you with empathy as the example, uh, the example on the t on the screen now. Your friend is distraught because she studied really hard for, a, for an exam and and still failed. And even though you got a good grade on the test, you remember what it is like to, to fail or not get a good grade. Uh, you don't try and fix things for your friends. Instead, you try and make an empathetic statement like, oh, I'm so, so sorry about your grade. Uh, research suggests that abstract concepts are easier to explain when there's an emotional connection with the word. And a really good example of that is empathy. But what if there isn't an emotion? When considering abstract concepts, the link between vocabulary, particularly tier three vocabulary, can't be overlooked. And assumptions that vocabulary and achievement, both concrete and abstract, needs to be a consideration. In Alex Quigley's book, Closing the Vocabulary Gap, students with a wealth of words can naturally make connections between related words. For learners with a restricted academic vocabulary, Making connections can prove more of a challenge that requires support and modelling. OK, we're going to move on to dual coding next. And the idea is that when you have the same information in two formats, words and visuals, that gives you two ways of remembering that information later, later on. Pictures are generally remembered better than words and can provide an additional memory cue when retrieving material and information. And within the call spec, the example of attachment theory contextualizes the verbal and visual combination. What dual coding isn't is the shift in opinion around learning styles and matching instruction to style does not improve learning. But because dual coding talks about combining visual and verbal forms, it can co sometimes cause confusion. But regardless of preference, students tend to learn better when you combine the two. So there are different ways to dual code and visually represent material. Many of these won't be new, new to you. I'm going to go to Janet again for some examples. Thanks, Helen. And I think this is a this is a really um, strong area for me because I resonate with this in terms of if there's large chunks of information, I want to immediately break it down. I want to categorize it. I want to, you know, we've got ideas of this concept map. We're, we're making, we're, we're trying to find shortcuts. Our brain is trying to find shortcuts of how am I going to remember that? How am I going to be able to retain all of that? Classic example when you might be looking at a process, you know, of the stages within a process. You break them down you want to maybe use icons I'm thinking straight away of um, development matters and the, the shapes the icons they have for the different age ranges that they um, have categorized so I think that use of infographics um, early early stories um, maybe not as, as common now as they used to be but you know cartoon strips that sort of thing where you're actually telling a story with pictures so you're getting a real feel and a richness for what might be going on behind the picture the image is making you recall something and, and reflect on something so for me it's about bringing together large chunks of information helping me see that in some kind of order or some kind of some kind of code and breaking it down as such and when there's complex processes and procedures protocol that I need to follow I maybe would prefer to see that as some kind of table or chart or flow chart on diagram and that would help me um, to recall and, and remember what's coming next rather than looking at a massive policy perhaps I like to see the flow chart that summarizes that but that triggers the learning and the information held within the larger documentation. Thanks, Janet. And wouldn't this be very easy to differentiate as well? Because students can be encouraged to create the image or the picture or the diagram, the infograph that would suit themselves uh, personally. 
Absolutely, I do. I do it all the time. Um, when we do, when we make bullet points, when we're summarising, when we're trying to make sense of people who um, like to colour code things, this is the use of dual coding. We're trying to make sense. We're categorising. We're putting things into in, into themes or areas that will trigger our memory and help us to remember what that might mean and what that's associated with. So where we can actually recall small chunks of information, like definitions, maybe the sort of how, what do we do, what order, the larger, more complex areas that we can't retain all of the time, and perhaps we don't use that information very often, then we need to have a process whereby um, we, we can actually understand that and get to grips with that. So where information is complex and a lot of information within the T level, within any new area of study will appear complex to our students. So the idea of breaking things down is a really useful way of doing things. And yes, absolutely, students will have their own way of making notes and being able to make sense of what they're doing. Thanks, Janet. So finally, retrieval practice, and we don't think retrieval practice needs much definition, explanation or many examples. But if we consider that every time a memory is brought forward, it is reconstructed and reinforced, then retrieval needs to be part of all classroom practice and the power of formative testing to retrieve what we've learned is a discussion worth having. And assessing for learning needn't be signposted by explicit formative tasks. These assessments can be implicitly woven into your teaching and learning and can be achieved by using continuous retrieval practice. As we explore this sixth strategy, it's a good place to look at each of these strategies in, in isolation. It's less effective than combining the power of more than one approach. This quote from Dylan William echoes that statement. Uh, as we discussed earlier, space practice or distributed practice, which Dylan refers to, means spacing retrieval and rec recall of knowledge over a period of time, rather than crammed practice regularly revisiting prior learned material. This is an important part of effectively planning a curriculum. Providing opportunity for your students to forget and relearn supports the transfer of knowledge to the long-term memory. Another part of this quote that stands out is testing. I feel the word testing evokes strong reactions, but it's part of life. Your students will be tested as part of their core assessment and beyond their T-level study. However, if we change testing to retrieval, so it reads, the benefits of practice retrieval and distributive learning are two of the most strongly supported learner strategies in all of psychology. It somehow feels more acceptable, but research shows that re regular retrieval practice and formative testing can reduce exam stress for summative assessments, and it should be encouraged as part of everyday practice. Without effective retrieval of the knowledge, students will struggle with the level three higher order thinking required in the core exams. And without effective retrieval of knowledge, students will struggle with the level three higher order thinking. But how does making retrieval as part of your everyday teaching effective for students learning? Furthermore, once we recognize its positive effect on learning, what retrieval strategies can we use in our daily teaching practice? Janet, what other examples or ideas could you share here, please? I, I'd go back to the what, why and how. Let's think about how we scaffold new areas of learning. Let's make sure that if a new area of learning that is, again, quite straightforward to us as tutors, it's got new terminology. Attachment is something that we're very familiar with, for example, but maybe the first time a student has heard that. Let's use that over and over again and let's use it in different contexts to make sure that those layers of learning around that new terminology is, is fully understood and, and, and that allows that student to apply new learning, to be able to recall a definition, that very straightforward, simplistic uh, understanding of that term, but also to be able to retrieve information that's been associated with that terminology in a range of different diverse situations and that will allow them when they're in that um, assessment process in that retrieval or distributive learning process to be able to apply it in a range of different contexts because they are familiar with it very often in these questions when we're when we are testing if you like these new um, concepts these, these new areas of learning 
it's the it's not the lack of knowledge it's the lack of familiarity in applying it so we haven't got the stretch of knowledge to be able to apply it in different situations we can merely define it with confidence and it's more risky for for the inexperienced learner to apply it in different situations so the more we can do that in our teaching and learning through careful scaffolding and constant retrieval practice um, is really significant to how confident those students will feel in a, a sort of more formal testing um, environment. Agreed and I think having a range of approaches, I mean some of the approaches on the screen now look look fun um, but not, not relying, not over relying on one or two of them. I think uh, if I ask the students to do, let's have a five minute brain dump of everything we've just talked about in relation to elements such and such or whatever. Um, I think making that as, as fun and interactive as possible does also mix up the, the, the strategies that we've talked about with peer learning and making sense of things. So yeah, lots of ideas there that uh, could be used as formative assessment activities, but also to inform teachers um, on how, on the progress of their students. Okay, thank you, Janet, you're wonderful. Uh, moving on now to the final part of this session, we're looking at re revision and exam preparation. So we've covered effective strategies which you, we, you, which you could implement in your teaching. They will help your students learn the core knowledge needed for the core assessments. But how can you remove the pressure that surrounds exams? For T-level students starting in September, they have arguably been through a turbulent journey arriving at the college or the sixth form that they do their T-level in. Presumably the normal year 10, 11 messages about having to make the most of the last two years at school, having to know that they want to study at college or want to progress onto a sixth form and, and what career choices they have. But all of these, whilst in a pandemic and con lack of continuity, educational disruption, uncertainty, and the relentlessness and continued pressure of COVID, that COVID, the pressure that COVID brought, culminating in the first externally assessed GCSE since 2019. Whilst they've been had the benefit of experience in terminal assessments, we can still support them to make the exams less daunting, but more importantly, building that learner autonomy so that they have the skills needed to approach exams with confidence such that exams aren't feared but become just part of lifelong learning. So what barriers do we think students face when they come to exams? And if we know there are barriers, what can we do as teachers to help students overcome them and have success in their exams? Pause and consider this just for a moment please. Okay, so here are a few strategies that we can use to support the students in their readiness for end assessment activities. Janet, can I ask you to talk through a couple of these, please? Yeah, absolutely. So if we were thinking about examples, I'm going to go to the examples of, of, of model answers because I think, again, it's about that practice, practice, practice. So where all the way through that teaching and learning, you're knowing that at the end of this, at the end of this qualification, students are going to have to retrieve this information, they're going to have to apply it, and they may well be ex expanding on that in terms of that um, what, why, and how, and applying that in different situations. So the more that you can have those um, those examples that allow for that analysis, that allow for that evaluation, and straight away there, you know, you can see different types of um, teaching styles, for example, using case studies, maybe having some reflective questions within a starter activity or um, a closing activity within a session. But using the words, I mean, I often say this, how often do we, do we say when we're having group work, very often we'll have group work with students and students will work together on, on, on a project or doing a little bit of research or something. And then when we bring them together, when we're actually giving feedback and we're receiving the information from the students, we don't necessarily talk in the words that we've got on some um, areas of this slide. We don't talk about, oh, that was a great analysis or that was a wonderful evaluation. We, you know, but what we could do is actually explain how something that they've produced um, either lacks or shows good analysis. And the same with evaluation. Again, these are new terms. If somebody's reading that for the first time, 
in an exam situation, it's going to feel unfamiliar. So breaking down these words themselves, what do they mean? How can we apply them? Um, and what's the complexity of it? Looking at questions and breaking it down across that embedding or, and that consolidation of, uh, of learning as well and thinking how these things could apply when we bring different elements together. Here's a question, and that's going to test or look at your retrieval knowledge across a range of elements that we've looked at so far. So bringing together and consolidating lots of examples that can be done as starters, as it says on here, through case studies, and also through our own teaching and learning where we are using those terms in diverse situations to show and to help students to recognize the diversity of terms like attachment, like holistic uh, and so on, and how they all link together and may have slightly different meanings depending on the context that they're applied. So lots of case studies and role plays also. Agreed, Janet. And also, there's not, no mention here on this slide of the practice tests and sample materials. Um, they're really good to use for formative assessment and preparing students for the summative assessment activities. But there's so much more we can do with them as well. I mean, I love the idea of having the answer there and then the student have to explain what the question could have been I mean I love that idea and I've also <laughs> seen in in action students writing their own questions um I was Absolutely. with an offset inspe inspector once uh, we, went, we went into a level one uh, technical vocational class and the students were writing the questions it allowed the teacher to very easily assess depth and breadth of understanding on each of the topics as the students discussed and re produced their own questions for each, other, for each other to answer. So there are many ways we can prepare students for its assessments um, other than simply providing them with sample assessment materials. Uh, I mean, how many of us today are guilty of cramming for an exam the night before, reading and rereading our notes, highlighting text and rereading some more, convincing ourselves we've learned the content. But if there's one takeaway from today's session, hopefully it is that there's no quick fix to learning, but instead tried and tested strategies, which help support the transfer of knowledge to the long-term memory for future recall. Hence, all of, the set, all of the activities and strategies we've talked about today can be used to support students in their revision, but they need to be taught. If our role as teachers is to support students to be self-regulated learners, who understand that they have learned what they have learned and how they've learned it and how, how they, they still need to know the strategies covered in today's session and they are all useful approaches for students to use in their own revision and thus for their own learning. So we've got an image on the screen now and it's called Folding Frenzy. It's a fantastic revision approach used by high school history teachers but the principles apply to T-level students too. It's a multi-layered technique that uses a range of strategies in one package to encode and synthesis further for better retrieval. So why? Research shows that note taking requires effort and encoding, which stores the information more firmly, opposed to cramming and highlighting classroom notes or handouts. So Mann in 2014 states that graphic organizers, specifically concept or event maps, are a vital tool to aid comprehension in any curriculum. So using a piece of A4 paper, on one page, students write some notes on the piece of paper on a specific topic. And for education early years, this may be an element or a theme. They focus on key vocabulary, summarizing the content and using symbols to represent ideas. Think of the benefit of dual coding here when it comes to one small image generating so much meaning. They then fold the paper in half and on one side they create a graphic organizer or mind map representing the core terminology of the notes. Then they fold in half again and on one side they create a flashcard, write down five or six key words that summarizes the topics. Then they flip the paper over and on the other half the student uses symbols from their original notes. So the idea behind revision clocks is that students focus on random topics, a category or one specific skill within a set time frame. And usually the time frame is 60 minutes and this can help to pace themselves accordingly through the core assessments. 
Revision clocks are ideal for revision as it's a directed task for students, which can include differentiated activities. It supports the students in needing to get both the basics and the complexities of, exa of examination correct. They have 20 minutes silent focus on the clocks, allowing them to really test their knowledge before communicating and getting help of their peers in the classroom on the questions they may be unsure of. This can be adapted to theorists, a summary of each element, legislation. The adaptability is what appeals to me here. And there are some other approaches as well. Janet, are there any here that stand out to you as being useful in education in early years particularly? I think what we're seeing is that they're all absolutely useful. And again, it comes back to what supports individual students. So finding, finding a way and finding something that works for them. And we've got some great examples here of that dual coding and that, well, that visual representation of information. And I think the more we can do that, but, but again, not cramming all of that, but allowing allowing for that to build over time and then maybe having some I think it's reassuring isn't it we like to think if I read this I'm, I'm going to be okay and the more concise that information is then then the better um, for students when it comes to that sort of um, a really immediate time before a testing opportunity so they're all really good examples it's finding the best one that works for the students and ensuring that diversity of, of, of opportunity um, um, is available for all of the students. Wonderful Agreed. ideas. Lovely, thank you, Janet. And I, I think what we've gone through today um, are a number of different and useful teaching and learning strategies and very easily applied to education and childcare. Thinking about that loop input approach, you, you're going to be using strategies and, and modeling them and explaining them with students to ensure that they either can then understand them and then apply and use them in their industry practice. The importance of being able to relate the learning and theory to practice is vital in the, in the T level. Okay, thank you. So if you have any questions or would like to access further support from the provider development team, uh, please contact us at the email address you can see on the screen now. And please also look at our other CPD and support sessions, both on the website and on our YouTube playlist. And that both of those are linked. Um, you can access through the links that are on the screen now. Love this quote from Clive Woodward, the moment you stop learning, you'll come second at best. And lifelong learning is an absolute term that we can use with our students and ourselves to apply and develop our practice. Janet, I'm just gonna hand over to you for some final words, please. OK, so my final takeaway would be remember that high executive functioning students, students who can apply to the very best of their ability are students who are familiar with, new, with that new knowledge and who've had the opportunity to explore it, to dissect it, to apply it and to really become familiar with it. So we're aiming towards that greatest potential of of high executive functioning through confident metacognition and that is through that reinforcement, through that recall, through that retrieval in lots of different ways through a, through a very careful scaffolded curriculum which I know is what everybody is, is striving and working hard to do. Thanks Helen. Thank you, Janet, and thank you, everybody, for, for watching today's session. Please do keep in touch with the provider development team, and we do really enjoy supporting your teaching and learning journey with your T-level students. Thank you, and this is the end of today's session.